Hello everyone, this is Eva Kassensmoor from Michigan State University. I am an associate professor in the School of Planning, Design and Construction, as well as jointly appointed in the Global Urban Studies program. So for my entire academic life, I've basically researched extreme events, most of which were mega events and in particular the Olympics. In the following 30 to 40 minutes, I'm going to talk about how the Olympics changed cities, why they changed cities, how cities have prepared for them, how they've dealt with the legacies that were sometimes good, sometimes bad, how people react to them, how citizens have risen up to fight against the Olympics, why they've done so, whether they've regretted it. And then I'm going to talk a little bit more about what interests you in a lively discussion, though I hope. So thank you so much for inviting me to your seminar series, and I'll start soon. The first section I'm going to talk about today is mega event cities and their legacies. As you can see in this map, these are all the cities who've ever hosted the Olympic Games. In all these cities, the Olympics left tremendous legacies. When I started this research, I was basically trying to ask what role do mega events like the Olympics play in urban development? In order to do so, I looked at various aspects and found that no one has ever looked at particularly the International Olympic Committee, meaning the mega event owner of the Olympic Games. So the fact was for me, when I did all my research, that these mega event owners exercise a very decisive influence on local transportation planning due to the requirements they impose, which have to hold during every single Olympic Games. The outcome then, because of these requirements, was basically that cities showed a distinct pattern of development, of urban development. On the one hand, the IOC has always claimed we are catalyzing urban plans, we are catalyzing transportation development. But when I did my research, I actually found that the IOC and mega event owners made cities deviate from their original plans. And instead, due to their requirements, catalyzed some but not all projects the cities had planned. And on the other hand, sometimes they even invented new developments in the cities. Based on that, I developed a theoretical model, a theoretical framework of urban change, where you have the theory of world cities and change agents, meaning the change agent being the mega event owner, in our case, the International Olympic Committee, and how they act as powerful agent of this change. Then theorizing this global influence on local cities and communities, we saw a dynamic of urban change that followed the theory of the urban planning process and how it develops. And then I looked at the effect or impact the Olympic Games have had on cities and saw manifestations as legacies or certain types of legacies that happen in cities, especially looking at transportation and urban development. The research methods I deployed was a comparative case studies between previous cities that had hosted the Games, Barcelona in 1992, Atlanta in 1996, Sydney in 2000, and Athens in 2004. My primary research design was actually using interviews with the International Olympic Committee, with political leaders, especially urban planners and private contract companies. Every now and then I pulled in citizens if they're involved in a certain capacity within the Olympic Organizing Committee. I also looked at archives in five different languages, used observations in Malkafis while living in these cities and trying to understand how they've changed. And then as secondary sources, I used existing data that was prevalent in the cities. Now, what did I find? I introduced the IOC as a major stakeholder in these games, but also as a change agent, because they had this vision of staging the best games ever. And when you look at speeches of past presidents, IOC presidents, when they finish the games, it always, they usually say they were the best games ever. And so, they required, meaning the IOC, perfect transportation capacities for the athletes, for heads of state. And the goal of the city matched it in saying, we want to become one of the great world cities who want to become famous for, through the Olympic Games. The other thing the IOC also had, it had the power to exercise the vision through its Olympic bidding process. So on the right hand side, the picture basically shows you how over time the IOC exercises influence on the cities that goes from 
applicant city seminars, truth candidate city seminars, foundation seminars, personal meetings. It goes over consultancy. So there's a long time frame between about 10 years when cities think about whether they should host the games and today to see whether these games can be staged, how they can be best staged. The first case study I'm going to introduce to you is Barcelona in 1992. So back in 1992, the games were very famous, were famous for making cities great. And Barcelona at the time had an urban plan that dedicated 10 separate areas within the cities for future urban development. And you can see those here. So you have here the Mediterranean Sea. And you have here these 10 dispersed urban areas that the city wanted to develop. Now, the Olympics for Barcelonians and for Spain in general was the idea that the Olympics would be a way to overcome the Franco area where this was a dictator who had ruled the country for a very long time. And so the metropolitan vision was for Barcelona, we want to create a new city. We want to open it up to the sea, meaning back then you had railway lines here running right along the coastal line, blocking access to the sea. They wanted to add travel capacity to the inner cities and avoid, these were major, major road arteries over here. They wanted to avoid traffic through the city and instead create a ring around the city. And then they wanted to increase or integrate the neighborhoods better. They were patchworks, but through the integration, they hoped to increase accessibility. Two of the Olympic areas were not accessible by public transport. That was the first problem they faced. And there was also no direct transport connection between the four areas. In order to solve this, they started creating a ring around the city. So I'm tracing it here with a mouse where they built a highway ring to connect the four areas. And you see here's a one, two, three, the fourth area. And due to these new road constructs, they would have a direct access link. So what did they do? Originally, this was the through traffic. Um, most of the arteries ran through the inner city. There was a lot of congestion. They were hoping in building the ring to actually relieve it. Now for the four Olympic areas, they created seven artificial beaches right over here. They created an Olympic village. These pictures, by the way, were taken um, back in 2002, um, where you can see still some stadia. They are very active. This is Montjuic, the mountain, which still has active venues. And this has remained as a large open space in the city. Now, in the short two years before the games, the um, the construction agencies within Barcelona created this highway ring and you see pictures how it looks like pretty much today still. And they also created accessibility to the Montjuic mountain, which is right behind here, so that um, people could get to the games venues. So how did that change Barcelona's plan? If you remember, these were the original 10 areas. Through the games, they added two more. So these two areas were uh, Olympic dedicated, 10 and 5, 10, 3, these are in connection where the previous already planned rejuvenations of the city. And they added um, a highway and a tunnel to increase accessibility to outerlying venues. So what happened, these were usually largely untold stories about the games that they added these two areas. And as you can see here, the goal was and this was basically talking about a person, Salah Shnokovsky, who's led the um, who's led the planning of the games. Was the IOC's priority was to easily transport Olympic family members, and hence improve the transport network of the streets and of the inner city. Moving forward, Atlanta 1996 was also planning to use the games as a means to rejuvenate the city. Atlanta's urban plan, as you can see here, was basically to put Atlanta on the world map. It was a very straightforward plan in order to get the Olympics to the city and make Atlanta famous across the world. The transport plan was fairly simple. They had highways stretching across the entire Atlanta region and just wanted to have a small extension of the metro to fulfill the needs. They also argued in their bid plans that 
the transportation approach that we're taking was to use the games as a test board for new traffic management systems within the city. And so the center of Atlanta basically became a very clustered venue arrangement. You see here in red and the blue, these are highways and metro lines crossing in the center of the city. So most of the venues were accessible by walking through metro lines and along the highways. And what they predicted back then about as you can see, six years before the games, was no major traffic problems can be expected in Atlanta for the 96 Olympic Games. Now, the Olympic outcomes, as many of you may know, that I was left with a very bad reputation for transport and that the games essentially didn't change the city or its citizens. Now, the transport change that the games brought to the city was one, a very new traffic management system. So what we would call ITS today, intelligent transportation system. They extended the Northern Metro line a little bit. And then you see several high occupancy vehicle lanes were kept because they were used during the games and were used after for travelers that uh, rode cars together. Now, moving on to Sydney in 2000, they had also very ambitious plans. Their plans, this is the urban plan of, of uh, Sydney and the Australian region, was again to create 10 different transport corridors um, and, and movements within their region. With the advent of the Olympic Games, they dedicated a completely new area, which was called Homebush Bay, um, to the Olympic Games, where most of the venues, and you see those in yellow here, would be clustered in one single location. The Olympic vision was to host the green games as in parallel, the IOC developed its vision to say, we want to become more green. In order to do so, they extended, or they basically refurbished, it was a brown field. They turned um, Homebush Bay into a green field, and you can see this here, um, where you see the venues up here in the back, you see large grasslands, and this one was a famous story where they had uh, planned to transport athletes over, uh, over water or across the water to Homebush Bay, but had to stop construction because they found an endangered spark species. So this entire project basically came to a halt and changed significantly how the athletes would be transported in Sydney. So in Sydney, you can see here, Here's Homebush, and this was about 80% of the venues were clustered here. There were some outer lying areas, but everything basically was connected by rail. However, Homebush Bay wasn't. It was too far away from the rail station. So their solution was basically to extend and build, extend an existing railway line or make it rather a loop. Um, here you can see the completely new train station that was built for the Olympics. And today this railway loop is basically a test track for trainees. It's barely used because buses are more convenient. However, whenever uh, large events are being staged in Sydney, they're accessible by public transport and in particular rail. Sydney's change of plans was also evident. Uh, we had a new monorail over here in downtown Sydney. We had much better connectivity between the airport and Sydney city center. And the screen dot is Homebush Bay, which wasn't in the original plans, nor were the monorail or the better connectivity to the airport. A quote from one of the planners was, I think bids by their definition need to be aspirational. Things get included that are not particularly useful from a transport point of view. You know, using ferry transport for athletes and official, I mean, that is a wonderful concept and I'm sure it is great at the time when bids are considered, but from a transport point of view, it is a complete annoyance, really. With this sentence, he basically referred back to how many demands the IOC had made for transportation and ultimately also that the plan to transport the athletes over water failed due to uh, frog species and construction delays. Athens in 2004 was probably one of the largest expansion of the local transportation capacity up until this date. So here you see the urban plan was developing three different metro lines or extending them to be more precise. And this was the tram line, the tram network that was planned to stretch throughout the Athens region. 
And here you can see where the Olympic Games venues were located. So you had the Olympic Village here, and you essentially had Waaka, Faliro, and Hellenica in the triangle where most of the Olympic competitions were to take place. The airport right um, in the right corner uh, was to be connected to these three uh, Olympic venue clusters. The interview said, we Athens get blackmailed during the Olympics. And I asked, what do you mean by blackmailed? And he said, we were given the yellow card, which means do whatever we want, which is a very clear quote of how the IOC pressed down on changing urban plans so that transport could function flawlessly during the games. Now, how did that look like? So first, they created a very strong connectivity and very strong ring with one-way traffic to avoid any congestion. The other extension was a tram line that got extended. This is, by the way, the new tram to connect the three venues with outer lying venues along the coast. Next major change was expanding the highway capacity to a point that it was accessible from the airport, linking it across the region into um, Athens. And they added and extended or more precisely changed the route of a new metro line. And these things all were built within the very short years before the Olympics. In fact, Athens became known to have inherited or used the Sertaki principle. The goal was to solve the traffic mess. And here again, you see Oaka, you see the different Faliro and Hellenicon as the centers of Olympic activities. So the newly built highways reached capacity within the next couple of years. The tram was yet to be completed. Suburban operational losses are, are happening still to today. And the metro reached capacity within a few years. So looking at the four cities in the IOC as an agent of change, we can see that the red areas are all developments the city had not planned for originally. So then rather than playing a catalytic role, which many academics, many cities in the IOC itself has claimed in urban development, it simply didn't happen. The IOC was more for, or more so pursuing an ideal transport system during the games and enforce the, these requirements to create that transport system to satisfy these peak demands. Because of that, we saw cities changing their original urban plans. So Barcelona is today known for an exemplary urban change. Atlanta's lessons was to handle the media with kid gloves because back in 1996, they rode on the public transit system, which became clogged and were not given any priority. As an argument, they took it out through the newspapers on how difficult it was to get to the games. Atlanta also became clear that it was a need for an extensive mass transit system. The third area that Atlanta rejuvenated was having a single entity to organize Olympic transportation. Back in Atlanta, they had multiple agencies trying to coordinate, which ultimately was very difficult. In Sydney, we started seeing a new transport, a specifically dedicated transfer advisor from the IOC. And in Athens, you saw the enforced changes in metro and tram routes. So over time, you saw more active involvement of the IOC in planning and hosting the Olympic Games. We saw four different models of urban change where you had the gates, entrance gates of Barcelona to the city through four different Olympic areas. You had the center as Atlanta, and you had Sydney as a remote location from the central business district out to Humbush Bay. And in Athens, you saw the triangle of three different Olympic venue clusters. So planning recommendations if a city was to host the games was to integrate land use and transportation planning. I mean, have a plan for these large open areas besides staging event. The other important lesson is to sustain coordinated transport and operations management. So during the Olympics, this was all handled under a single entity with a single goal, which increased coordination tremendously among the agencies, which really helped move a lot of people due to usually our in-migration and the growth of cities, these coordinated transport operations management systems should stay in place. The third recommendation is to catalyze necessary transport infrastructure in terms of 
what does the city really need? Most of the time, we need a better transportation system between the airport and our central business district. For that, the games are great if the land use, as mentioned in one, is carefully chosen. The fourth recommendation would be to expand the planning horizon, which the IOC actually have done from usually seven years out to nine or 10 years now, where cities can think about earlier how they would like to handle the Olympic Games. With that, I'm pausing for a second. Now think about what I just told you. Think about, do you see any commonalities between the four cities? So up until just about five years ago, the argument was entirely based on, given the diversity of the land use choices for sporting facilities across five hosts or four hosts or three hosts, the pre-existing transport structure and the very different travel routes in different countries and different cities, Olympic transport provisions have produced very different legacies and each host city has a unique legacy. Now think again, think back about what I just told you and try to come up with six different arguments why that is not the case. I'll give you a minute. Have you found one, two, three? Now let me help you. So when I looked at these different cities, I saw the following. I saw six different things that all cities had in common, and all of them produced very similar legacies. Now let me go into each of those to explain what they are. The new hypothesis that I came up with, because they have the same requirements, they have to have somewhat similar legacies. So they all transport about 80,000 VIPs, athletes, media, judges, they're all transport, working staff, volunteers, about 200,000, and visitors, which range widely between one and two million, and more so even residents between two and 12 million. So the argument was, there are same demands, there are same best practices that get transferred from one city to the next, to the next, as I have shown in a previous slide. So there are certain Olympic drivers that might create similar legacies, and they do. The first legacy that we've seen were new or improved airport city center connections because those are extremely important to transport athletes, to transport visitors from the airport to hotel destinations or from the airport to various venue clusters. And so when we looked at the five cities that I analyzed, Barcelona, Atlanta, Sydney, Athens, and London, we always saw improved or new highway connections. We saw railway lines being improved and we saw metro lines being approved between the city center and the airport. The second legacy was you see airport improvements across the cities, sometimes even adding a terminal, sometimes even adding or upgrading a runway, but most of the time just refurbishing older airports and increasing the capacity and through flow capacity of luggage belts, of people, the third legacies we saw were also either newly created or revitalized parks. Homebush Bay is a case in point. London was a case in point of rejuvenating its east. And many other cities did the same of creating these new parks and open spaces to have visitors and residents enjoy the games. The fourth legacy that you saw some type of new high capacity transport modes between the cities. And so basically asking what is the capacity to and from these mean in Centennial Park and Homebush Bay, the two key center areas where most of the big games were taking place at a throughput capacity of 400 or 500,000 people per hour. Then we saw new Olympic route networks that were in essence needing additional road capacity. So when you look at different excuse me, different Olympic services, you're seeing Olympic associates and their required transport services. So T1 was usually 
higher VIPs, heads of state, T2, T3, T4, T5 going down, they all had certain requirements the city had to fulfill from signal drivers even to buses to dedicated lanes with the requirement there cannot be any congestion for athletes between the Olympic Village to actually reach their competition venues. And the six legacies that we frequently saw, especially so in Atlanta, were new advanced intelligent transportation systems where cities essentially upgraded their intelligent routing, intelligent speedways, roadways, and better coordination among all transport and transit agencies. Now, if we know that, how can we leverage these Olympic drivers that necessarily come to the city? And so you see here in the middle in the circles, you see the six different legacies the Olympics produce. So if you know airport improvements take place, if you know new improved airport city centers can, can it, center connections take place, locate steady along these center connections or leverage planned airport extensions at the time. Your invitalized packs is placing more temporary venues in planned or existing parks rather than creating completely new ones. New high capacity transport modes is again placing these venue clusters that you will essentially need for in games alongside these rail system. And then of course, due to the additional road capacity, it's not necessarily the shortest distance, but maybe another five minutes of additional travel time can leverage planned road construction for the city already. And then advanced internet and transportation system was looking to plan for existing high occupancy vehicle line corridors or BRT routes so that these would happen either way. Now that I've talked about the five Olympics, Barcelona, Atlanta, Sydney, Athens, a little bit about London you've seen, I'd like to do a little bit more deep dive into Rio de Janeiro, which was staging the games in 2016 and was the first city in South America to ever have done so. Now, given the history of the city, given the history of the country, very interesting patterns emerged. Rio de Janeiro had really advertised itself with a great prospect of having tremendous Olympic transportation legacies. And one of which, which they became famous for, were bus rapid transit systems or called BRTs. So they decided when we were staging the Rio Summer Olympics in 2016, we would like to develop four clusters, very similar to Barcelona, four clusters, different parts of the city, in Brazil, this was where expanding these clusters was a very ambitious project. They were on Diodoro, Copacabana, Barra de Chuca, and Maracanã. Now, when you're looking at the Olympic plans, you're seeing these four, Diodoro, Maracanã, Copacabana, and Barra de Chuca, all connected through green, blue, or red, lines and I'll go into that a little bit in detail but just like Barcelona Rio also intended to connect its four areas through high capacity transportation modes. Now Maracanã for many of you this will be something you already know is the historical and cultural center of Brazilian soccer. It is one of the largest stadiums in the world and was completely renovated through the Olympic Games. Porto Maravilla also was redeveloped and it used to be where a lot of the poorest residents in Rio resided. Now with a 3.54 billion investment, it became a tourist attraction, new 5 million square meters, new pipe and cycle paths, new avenues, new museums, all upgraded to make Rio presentable to the world. The Olympic Village in itself was in Barra Chichuca, also where a lot of the poorest residents resided um, in Rio, became an Olympic golf course, a waterside park, and got completely changed because of the Olympics. In order to do so, slums were completely cleared out and residents relocated 50 kilometers west of the city, losing their home, losing the access to the jobs, just to turn them into tourist attractions 
or make them resemble for the city. And you've probably seen there were night raids, there were a lot of military right before the games to clear residents and make way for Olympic construction. In terms of transportation, what the city was trying to do was connect them through bus rapid transit system. So what many people don't know is that these systems weren't planned originally. Originally, these were supposed to be connected with metro lines, which would have a much higher capacity than BRTs plus they are underground. So we were trying to understand what impact that change in transportation mode had on people. So we looked at what is required. They looked 28 sports, 300 competitions, they need open space, easy access, they need to separate athletes and spectators, and promised that about 45 minutes, every athlete could reach 80% of the venues from their Olympic village. There shouldn't be any congestion, and the athletes should always be separated from media and spectators. All transport was to be organized in one center. Now, we looked at the construction, we looked at where these places were located, and we came up with this map, which basically tells you where the BRTs ran, where the metro lines ran. And you can see here's Maracanã, Diodoro, Barra de Juca, and Copacabana. And these lines were all bus rapid transit systems running over ground. We mapped out where Transoeste was running. We mapped out where the Transcariota was running from Barra de Juca to the airport. We looked at the Trans Brazil, who connected ultimately Maracanã to Diogo and Trans Olympica. This was the most contentious line because it was running through wetlands and very protected areas. And we also mapped where the favelas was, where and how these BRTs cut through them. And essentially what we found, this is an entire listing of the map that you just saw, that the Trans Olympica was the one that was very highly contentious because it affected a lot of favelas, it affected 17.33%. That had tremendous impact on local populations because it basically cut off natural crossings to the families, to their communities. They were removed to outerlying areas. And so the social impacts were not only along their trajectory, but also in terms of informal commerce. People were using the streets to sell, to cross. Um, the busy streets, there were a clear articulation between one side of a community with the other. But with the BRT running through with barriers, plowing through existing neighborhoods, that wouldn't happen anymore. And there were only very few bridges for a pedestrian to overcome these, um, these barriers, these physical barriers going through their communities. We saw a lot of fatalities. And of course, as mentioned before, the forcible removal of multiple favela communities due to eminent domain. So why, why would the city do it? We found essentially six different reasons. One, BRTs were much more low cost than high capacity rail system. They were faster to implement, speed of implementation, because with a seven year preparation time, building a metro line that extensive would have taken usually much more time. They were flexible, another very interesting argument because they could be adjusted, they could be changed on a moment's notice if something was to, um, to happen. It was very easy to acquire the land because usually they just upgraded existing roads. Then there were also certain political coalitions that favored BRTs, those who were in power, were owning bus companies and were really pushing forwards to make the BRTs instead of the high high capacity rail system happens. And then the final argument was that there's also some type of best practice knowledge existing in Brazil about bus rapid transit system because it has been a common practice to construct these in Brazil. Now moving on, I would like to talk a little bit more about other impact Olympics had on Rio. Today, I've mostly talked about infrastructure improvements how people can move, operations. Now I'd like to focus a little bit more on the fact of exposure, of the willingness of cities to become global cities through the Olympic Games. In order to do so, colleagues of mine and I, we've looked at 
how do cities become exposed globally? One way was looking at social media and in particular tweets. So what we're trying to do, we were looking at Olympic tweeters and see to what extent actually do the Olympic Games affect global perception, carry the word about Rio to the world. And in order to do so, we looked at what is the visibility? What is the positive host city branding? Does it take place? Is it worth the investment? And no one has ever looked at it. Were claims the AOC and other host cities have done basing it on a narrative. And so we've looked at the literature and found a lot of positive imagery for the games, yet rarely any hard facts on big data. There were increased tourism numbers that dissipated over the years and a claimed better destination image than before. Now, how would we test that? We looked at that destination branding is often controlled by cities to portray, portray a carefully chosen image. Now, social media changes that marketing approach because this, this image is open to interpretation. Imagery gets tweeted from one area to the next without much influence of the government. And these usually derive from people visiting or knowing the place, not necessarily for televised events, but rather how do people feel about the games and how do they tweet about them. So our part approach was looking particularly at Twitter as a rich data source for scholars to track this global audience and analyze sentiments and language in how these games were being described. Approach this through different research question and we first started with just basically capturing tweets. So we captured well over three million tweets across the world between May 24th through September the 12th. Notably, from August 5th through the August 21st, where the Olympic Flames were taking place 2016 in Rio. And we got about only 1% of all tweets with Olympic-related hashtags during that period. So the 3 million represent only 1% of what was actually tweeted. Now we asked, to what extent do the Olympics actually receive worldwide international attention on Twitter? That was fairly easy because we're trying to figure out what is the most popular topic? So the current and immediate past and immediate future host city receive the attention. So you're seeing hashtags with Rio 2016 or the Olympic Games. They received attention. Very little went to Tokyo 2020 or London 2012. Now we're looking more closely into how did it change? How much did it change? How did it impact? impact that perception. So which emotions, which sentiments dominated on that Twitter sphere? So we basically identified sentiment and emotion keywords through an emotion lexicon that was developed by Muhammad and Chinese in 2010. These were uh, the code basically identified for us emotions such as anger, anticipation, disgust, fear, joy, sadness, surprise, and trust. In doing so, we found the following imagery. We had positive imagery for Rio, positive imagery for the Olympics, negative ones more so for the Olympics than Rio, and the neutral ones were very similar. Then we asked, when is that being tweeted? And it's a, primarily a Teflon event. So you're seeing here the increase in tweeting activity right around the Olympic Games. And we split them up into different positive, negative, and different emotion lexicon words. And you see they all similarly follow the trend around the Games. So we see very clearly positive dominates. Here's the negative line. And then the positive imagery really dominated. The next question was, what is spatially the case? So we were looking at sentiments and emotion keywords, but how does that distinguish between space? And so we looked at inside of Rio versus outside of Rio. And you see that the percentage outside of Rio is much higher than the percentage inside of Rio. We see similar spikes so much more so positive from outside. And that last question we asked then, who actually shapes that public perception? Is it tourism agencies? Is it single tweeters? And we found that inside of Rio, certain thought leaders 
were tweeting relatively infrequently. And so what is the result? Twitter provides these insights into public opinion about a mega event. And we've clearly seen that the positive sentiment outweighs the negative sentiment about Rio 2016. And those who tweet the most were not necessarily the most influential ones. Seen through broadcasters, the Olympics look thus fairly good. But we also saw that the Olympics are clearly a tough one. But the host city is not. So the legacy stays within the Olympics, not necessarily within the host city. The next thing I would like to discuss a little bit more is what happens when the Olympics actually fail, when the Olympics don't come to town, when the bidding is stopped in its tracks. So we're taking a look at the Boston case, that bid for the 2024 case. I'm going to walk you through how Boston 2024 thought about planning for the games and how residents of the city actually thought about doing the very same thing, yet trying to stop it. As you might know, Boston 2024 was a bidding agency who was the front runner in the bid for the 2024 games, beat out LA who ultimately won the games. Now, how did that happen? What you basically what want you to take away from this particular one is that the Olympic project is extremely complex and undertaken for decades of planning for essentially a seven year implementation window that mega events significantly alter the way mega projects are being planned and implemented. And I'll show that to you in a little bit. And that usually Olympic games overpromise and underperform. The final lesson is that legacy actually need a dollar amount behind it and not merely a vision, which a lot of cities have done to date. So when you define the scale of an Olympic prayer bridge, how do you define it? So this is a poll that was taken with Boston residents. And as we can clearly see, impact stands out as what will the scale be? A lot of costs, money, dollars, a lot of resources required, and it's tremendous in size. Now, when you look at the Olympic timeline, Selection of the candidate happened in Boston about eight years prior to the games, and usually about five cities are being selected. Then you have some plan, you have refine, and then you have seven years to implement, but what do you sustain? Now, here's the timeline Boston bid for the games. It bid in February 2013 to the NOC asking for an initial idea of the games. Then the bid occurred in September 2015, submitted and selection. And then the hope was, what do you sustain 2030 and beyond? So let me ask you, how much did the most expensive Olympic Games cost? Anyone still remember? Here it is. Sochi was $52 billion. Here are the ones from the past. If you remember Montreal, most of the games were a lot of Canadians still remember it as the big O, so O-W-E, for owing so much money, and it took them 30 years to pay off the debt. That was 1.2 million. Sochi was 52 billion. Now, how does an Olympic organizing structure look like? As you see here, this is very, very complex, and this is the Japan Olympic Committee that uh, was trying to put the most comprehensive together. In contrast, Boston bid list 37 official volunteers at the time when that was in the bidding phase. Now, if you remember, here is how many people get transported for the games. We had peace, IOC, between 30,000, Athens had 75,000, so we're around here, a little bit higher. And then you have visitors and viewers, volunteer staff that need to get transported. So the sports infrastructure was about venues, you need about 33, and you have about over 300 competition events taking place in those venues. For accommodation infrastructure, you need about 50,000 hotel rooms within 50 kilometers, 25 within 10 kilometers. You need a large media village, and uh, this was supposed to be newly constructed. And then you need a transport infrastructure, which the bid had proclaimed it will be walkable Olympics, we need about 5.3 billion investments before the Olympic Games. 
The claim was also 75% of the land was already publicly owned, 25% will have to be bought, yet this didn't show up in any bid budget. Labor volunteer workforce would cost about $600,000, and the investments, so the claim, would be funded 100% from private sources, and here was the structure of how they would create and bring in that type of money, primarily through public-private partnerships. And then there's a question, isn't that a deviation of the resources from the city itself? The next poll I took with the students was, who are actually the stakeholders of the 2024 games? The MBTA that shows up here is actually the local metro transit agency that shows up here as one of the main stakeholders, the taxpayers, the government, the president, and you see the world showing up as well. It's very international. These are the stakeholders for a very localized game. So this Olympic project is extremely complex and it usually takes seven years. So how do you think mega events influence these mega projects? If you think about it, what's the, what's the distinction between planning and implementation? Well, in between is the winning of the bid, where you switch in an instant between planning and implementation and you get the goal. Now, the problem with this is compared to other mega projects or any other projects, you get a fixed deadline. So to build or not to build is out of the question. You can't scale back, you have to build. And that has important implication for the time cost specification and scope of the project. So when you think about it, planning has to be on time. And during the planning phase, it's always, oh, we have seven years, there's still plenty of time. But implementation always have, have to happen on time, always have to comply with the date of the opening ceremony. So the consequence of what seems times is you see a lot of closed door politics, you see a neglect of environmental procedures, and you see the involvement of very few, very selected stakeholders who frequently are in support of the project and not necessarily critical voices. So when you remember this picture I showed you before, do you remember how long this transformation took place? From here to here? It took about 1.5 years. How long did they plan? 25 years. 25 years in the making of reorganizing personal now. So how do you think the cost is affected between planning and implementation. In the planning page, you are thinking of within budget, you had no taxpayer money committed during the planning stage. The implementation, however, is if there's cost overruns, you will always have guarantees that are required by the LEC, and it is written in a contract that the city or the state assumes cost overruns to ensure the games would take place. So the on-time considerations essentially es escalates costs. You have infrastructure projects that are on steroids because they have to get finished fast on time. And Zimbabwe back then predicted about 400% of cost overruns for the games if they were staged in Boston. If you look at it as an example, Barcelona exceeded, well exceeded it. So did London, so did Sochi. So how does this happen? So one is, Forbes claimed it's very simple. You understate the expensive to, to convince citizens. You act surprised when the expenses begin to escalate. And then you act surprised again when revenue and economic benefit projections aren't met. Boston bid books back then looked at this. So they basically claimed these are infrastructure costs. These are the sources of funding. How the costs would be generated, how this money was to be raised. Question was, was it realistic? Well, no, because it didn't include certain games budgets like transportation infrastructure that had to get upgraded. And as we've seen so far, these are tremendous upgrades that need to happen. And it was all argued it was 137 billion that was already authorized. But what happens when cost overruns happen? Where will the funds be taps? And unaccounted for was who pays for the fee free public transit that usually is now a given during the Olympic Games. What about specifications? The planning always says, yes, we'll build according to secure safety measures, we build according to specifications. Implementation sometimes happens, you have minimum safety standards. B 
because the on-time consideration, considerations might suppress those desired specifications. Case in point was the bus rapid transit line in Rio, which after very few months, six months post-construction, already showed signs of deterioration. What about the scope? The planning is large and connected to other infrastructure investments, but the reality is what needs to get done for the games will get done. Other things are getting delayed or indefinitely postponed. I've shown you, shown you some of these issues in the previous slides. So when you're increasing the scope of a mega project, it's not necessarily a catalyst anymore because on-time considerations might actually reduce the scope of what you had originally planned. Scope as an example. Here you see the third venue cluster for the Athens Olympic Games. The legacy that was supposed to be come out of this basically canceled or closed airport was a large metropolitan park, which was supposed to be one of the greatest in Europe. However, due to funding, this never happened. This was the plan that were abandoned in 2008, about four years after the games, because there were no sources to fund something like this. Boston's Midtown was planned to be the center of Olympic activity with a largely empty space, so though contentious, would be the Olympic Boulevard and the Olympic Stadium. So these mega events basically significantly alter the way mega projects are being planned and implemented. So what would have happened to Boston Midtowns? Now, what are the costs of an Olympic project? Most of it is construction and maintenance. And how much is that? What are the benefits? Pride and infrastructure. Is it worth it? Now we've discussed infrastructure in a sense of what is catalyzed, what the city really needs, and what the Olympics give to the city instead of what was being planned before. There's also then a question about short-term versus long-term. So economic growth you see in the short-term, not in the long-term. You see employment in the short-term, not in the long-term, primarily blue-collar jobs. You see tourism short-term, not long-term. You see global media attention short-term, not long-term. And you see federal dollars in support short-term, not long-term. So all these things have been proven by researchers over the past decade or so. Private funding, again, as long as it's for the games, to make sure it happens, as long as it's in the best interest of whoever gives the money, it will be there. Long-term, not so much. So usually you see that the Olympic Games overpromise up front and then underperform. What about cost and fairness evolving around legacy? You see urban development, short term you see it happen, so you see stadia rise up, but what happens to the long term? Homebush Bay stands was never changed. At that Athens, the airport still didn't get turned into an Olympic park. So London was actually a very interesting example where significant dollar amounts were set aside to create the legacy of the games. That's why they were called Regeneration Games. And so you had one year of closing in the park after the games happened. And then you had 700 new homes and about half a billion dollars in investment. What about short term, long term? Again, short term, public transit is there. These are existing underweight structures, but to make it beneficial long term, you need further investments. So legacy in itself needs dollars, not merely a vision, which is usually just being sold to residents and the IOC without any significant commitment of funding. So looking at that impact, what do we learn from it? How can we change something like this? Boston residents clearly decided it's not worth the risk. So after thinking about how much they would have to invest, citizens mobilized and fought the idea of the Olympic Games. So this is an analysis of what actually would have happened or how this transportation project gets squashed. It's an inside view into the planning of transport for the games. So the boosters basically argued these, there will be improved transportation systems after the games. And the opponent said transportation improvements should take place without a mega event and that the bid actually deviates important resources from necessary transport projects. So this basically left me with, with providing transport policymakers a better understanding of how to make decisions under grand opportunities like the Olympic Games. 
what is the outcome? Can you improve transportation systems or is it merely short term? So when we looked at how this bid evolved between fall 2012 until July 2015, when the mayor watch actually ended the Olympic bid, there were certain steps the Olympic bidding committee took in order to plan for transportation. So I looked at specifically transportation. I did an ethnography as a staff member in Boston 2024, interviewed all staff members, and had access to internal planning documents. As secondary sources, I looked at local media reports and official published planning documents. We're looking at stra the strategy of decisions. How do you make big decisions? And if you look at quadrant one, it's incremental change under high uncertainty. You look at quadrant two, large change, high uncertainty. There's this kind of utopian decision making, future thinking. You see incremental change in the understanding where you have incremental politics. And then you have the large fourth quadrant, which the Olympics fall under. It's a large change, yet you have very low understanding. Method to do so is not formalized or understood. And they come with wars, revolutions, crisis, and grand opportunities. And I argued the Olympics might have been a grand opportunity. So how do you approach it? What's the difference? How do you solve problems of this high complexity, uncertainty, and unpredictability and brought together public policy and planning? So Boston 2024 VP said, my personal motivation was really focused on this once in a generation chance, next to our new opportunity to think big and bold and potentially do something transformative for the city that we all love. We were good intentions, there was a grand opportunity. How do you realize it? And so there were similarities between planning when they originally planned the bid for the NOC, so the initial stage of going or submitting a bid to the games, and you had very similar approaches. You had high uncertainty, trying to hit a moving target as new developments from the IOC came forward. You had a significant potential for change. You had very high risk positions in terms of monetary value or not making the bid fail at the time. You had complex decisions with system-wide impacts, little prior knowledge. It's very contentious and it challenged the social consensus in the city. It was urgent because there were certain time pressures. So in bid 1.0, it was close door planning. It was done by experts. It was big picture that closely resembles how crises are being decided on. Now with bid 2.2 after January 8th, once the bid actually became public, it became highly visible. The documents were posted. There were a lot of interviews given and the planning became for public understandability. How do you make people understand why the Olympics, especially in terms of transportation, may be beneficial? for the population. And it also changed to a small scale planning, trying to go down to under, making people understand why certain congestion was necessary to get there. And so this part, the red one, differs very much from the pre-existing frameworks of crisis characteristics and grant opportunities. So we had now high visibility that led to very high scrutiny. So there was frustration with the press when there was a proclamation because of the winter breakdown, it wouldn't happen in the summer because it's the summer games, there's no snow. And then there was also public understandability where you saw a slow reduction in complexity and higher cost. So the planning and transport came an emphasis on making it look good, look good to the public versus actually going by the numbers and crunching models. And one planner basically said, this is not how you do things. It was a complete and utter reject of how the planning process changed. And then when we break down what Boston 2024 had planned, and I'm not going into significantly into each one of them, but all of these transportation projects fell in one quadrant or another in terms of how they would change. So as you saw the, over time, this one, meaning the large change, low understanding transportation projects were ultimately canceled that were hoped for bringing in renewed economic stimulus to the region because they were simply too complex. The next thing that got canceled were incremental changes that required low understanding, large changes that required investments, and all that was presented fell basically in quadrant one where you had a very high understanding and it would make incremental changes like 
signal and breaker upgrades, which are minor upgrades within the existing metro lines. So planning in Boston reflected this very simple irony. The opportunity to think big was there, but there was no resources, no time or not, no public report to do so. So the, the difference with grand opportunities, they were forced to start with a solution. They knew they had to perform for the games and then identify problems backtracing that the megamans can viably solve. The decision-making decision is also transparent, opening up the decision-making process itself to immediate scrutiny, which you never see during crises, usually not, at least not in wars. And then you see the decision-makers must serve many, many clients who vigorously voice their competing goals and objectives to the media. So what we concluded back then was when bits remained hidden, grand opportunities evolved. It was big picture thinking, there was how can we improve the region. But when they become public, these grand opportunities were essentially squashed in light of the costs and in favor of short-term goals and the ability to convince the public that these investments were necessary. So now that I've introduced a little bit about Boston and how the bid failed, how it changed transport priorities, the next issue and the final issue in this um, online broadcast would be to talk about what happens or what will happen in Los Angeles as they've won the 2028 Olympic Games. So the 2028 Olympic Games will take place in Los Angeles and I've basically just published an open access book on these Olympic Games and I'll summarize it for you really briefly here. So the premise of the LA Games was, we've done it before, we can do it again. So you've seen what the legacies brought in 1932, in 1984, and the argument was, these will happen in 2028 again. So what they've done was, they shaped the Olympic brand and the Los Angeles brand, they created an unprecedented athlete experience, and they implemented certain but minor urban changes. So the question was, why was Los Angeles able to win the games in the current anti-Olympic bidding climate? Why does the we've done it before, we can do it again, may create problematic legacies? And if so, how can we avoid those? So looking at a comparison, yeah, in 1932, you had a Great Depression happening. And back then, the 1932 Olympics were supposed to move the imagery the U.S. had away from that depression onto something better, something lighter. Back then, the, there were two prior bids, 1924-28. The LA won the games because they were the only bid city back then. Bid plan took about nine, year, nine years. They had 117 events, 1,300 athletes, 14 sports, and 15 venues. Most of those were existing yet refurbished. Most of these things back then were supported by the public at large. There were certain investments to get the athletes to a place. At the time, really no one had really heard of Los Angeles. Now in 1984, so there were many, many prior bids happening before. But again, in 84, LA won because it was the only bid city after the Montreal debacle. Had about six years to plan. You can see the scale increased tremendously between these two. And in the front row stood basically the security of the games and the costs. In 2028, you have seen again three bids that happened before. 2020 again, LA was the only bid city. They have now 11 years to prepare, so way more than before. And again, the scale almost has increased at the same rate. 28 sports, 38 venues, and there is a certain anti-Olympic bidding climate. So going back to 1932, what did the games do for Los Angeles? It was a plan to create a global reputation, and it was to set up the games as a movie set. As a legacy, what remained was it put Los Angeles on the world's map and created the Southern California Olympic Committee, which still exists today and still supports the idea of the Olympic Games and local sport competitions, as well as athletes. Now, way back when, 
You saw this as the famous Colosseum, where the athletes took place. It was packed at the time. And then as for the athlete experience, they needed to attract athletes. So there were temporary travel support systems in place. And they created as a legacy so the largest participation due to the funding that provided for the athletes to actually get to the games in LA. Urban changes were minimal. Uh, there were temporary Olympic facilities, temporary Olympic housing that were sold after the games were over. They created only three new stadia. And as a legacy, it remained that there should be something like an Olympic village as a concept. Now looking at 1984, and again, the same, the same structure. So we're looking at shaping the Olympic in LA brand. There was the plan to commercialize the games extensively. There was a legacy that the games was a business proposition. So the so-called mega event strategy that was highly advertised back then, where you use the games to stimulate local growth and business. For the athletes, what happened, it was based on television urbanism. So reporters had frequent access to the athletes. The city was dressed in the same colors. And as the legacy, we see an LA84 foundation, which is still very active today in supporting athletes, training athletes, building youth programs in Los Angeles. Now, urban changes were also quite minimal. They used existing facilities. They used university the university games, so they used local campuses to stage the games. And what remained as a legacy was upgraded facilities for local universities. Now jumping to 2028, how is the plan? What, how do we shape the Olympic and LA brand? The plan was to one, be sustainable and to align it with long-term plans, which we've seen frequently as, um, as Olympic cities that buy for the games present themselves to be sustainable and that everything they do is aligned with the long-term strategic plan. The legacy should be refreshing the Olympic brand in that anti-Olympic climate. Can LA do that? So we created an athlete experience where they called it even the ultimate athlete experience. And one of which was to put athletes in the center in a way that there's multiple or in, in stern crannes hosting opening and closing ceremonies using two stadia. Mm -hmm. One, the old Coliseum, which is a legacy stadium, which had hosted the games in um, 32 and 84, where opening and closing ceremonies took place, but also adding a new stadium that was just recently completed, where you would have the latest technology and much more seating capacity to welcome everyone as visitors. Urban changes, the plan was to align it with existing plans, but as a legacy, the stadium I just mentioned is the Rams Charger Stadium, where this was created to basically for a new, for the new teams, but was also created in a sense to be using it as the main Olympic stadium for closing and opening ceremonies under high tech conditions. The other legacy that remained is that the mayor had announced a 28 by 28 initiative, which is focused on transportation, transportation accelerations to be completed before 2028. So why did LA win the bid in an anti-Olympic climate? So one is history matters. Many people bought the argument, we've done the blue war, we can do it again. There's a certain institutionalization of the bidding process within LA where someone just picked up the phone and said, I need this signed, you've signed it before, can you just do it again? And the response was always yes. The other main change we see is that global, not local elites bid. So way back in 32 and 84, you saw a lot of local elites like newspaper owners, local real estate developers, local transit agencies, leaders bid for the games. Now you see more and more the involvement of leaders at Goldman Sachs or large scale media corporations. Some of them are still hosted in Los Angeles, but the impact of those are much broader. And the fourth thing why LA won the bid was because they learned from the bid failure in the current global political climate. They looked at Boston saying, oh, you guys opened the bidding process. We're not going to do it, which a lot of um, academics, including myself, have argued if you open the bidding process, it's more fair. It's more inclusionary. But ultimately what happened, then the bid failed. LA wasn't going to make that mistake and still very much closes on having people allowed to look at Olympic bid books, the, the reports that are being handed up very short, 
to keep as much information to themselves as possible. So just looking at the comparison and the games budget, here's the one before, the profits, the public referendum. So here is very interesting. California voters actually approved it. Voters prohibit an extension. Here, you only see for 28 public opinion polls that vary widely depending on who conducted it, either the Olympic bidding committee or actually Pullman groups. It's very opaque. There's no referendum. There's no votes more allowed. So way more constrained democratically than has happened in 32 or 84. The whole city contract was not existent in 32. It wasn't signed in 84, yet it was signed in 2028. And then financial liability was back then on California, then on the USAC, and now it falls on LA-28. Now, everybody who knows the Olympics knows that LA-28, the bidding committee or organizing committee in that case, will immediately dissipate it after the end of the gate, games. It will be dissolved. So there is no liability possible because that company simply won't exist right after the games. The transport infrastructure needed is car shuttle, buses, stations, and here's one of the main differences again. There's about 300 billion in public transit that's already planned that will get invested in the games according to the 28 by 28 initiative. Now, what are the conclusions? So shaping the Olympic NLA brand, I don't think it will necessarily renew the bidding climate because the fundamental problems with bidding have been ignored in LA's bidding process. It was the intransparency, it was the budgeting, and the other part is that LA already owns its global brand. It doesn't need a new one, while technology still is a wild card that will remain up until the games are being staged. In terms of athlete experience, the athlete extravaganza, especially as it might create operational legacy for future games, is tying the Olympics to the success of a newly built stadium and having a dual closing opening ceremony. And finally, implementing the urban changes that cities now need private sector resources once the game went global, global experiences. The existing infrastructure is not just Stadia, but it's much more so. Plus, they have the infrastructure, they committed substantial amounts to transportation, and they have positive living legacies as proof. For example, the AA84 Foundation. So my question was then, how many cities have it highly doubting that that could actually resolve the opposition to the Olympic Games. So now that I've introduced you to the case studies I've done, um, I'm really looking forward to having the discussion with you and I'm sure you will have some questions about Tokyo. So I'm really looking forward to talking with you about how the Olympics impact cities and how they can, cannot, should or shouldn't shape the Olympics and cities with cities themselves. Okay, see you soon.